We've got Ian Kaplan on the podcast. Ian is the COO of Hybrid Performance Method and soon to be Doctor of Chiropractic Medicine. Uh, Ian and I spent some time together about a year ago at an event at OPEX in Scottsdale. We actually stayed at like a weird, scammy Airbnb mill type of thing, which is uh, pretty funny looking back at that in retrospect, and nerded out and talked about a bunch of epistemic uncertainty and science and how no one actually knows anything, which is, you know, a super sexy message. But Ian has been using uh, the platform provided by hybrid to to get that message out into the world. And in this podcast, we talk about some pain science stuff, how to deal with that uncertainty where no one actually knows anything and, and what you should do, uh, given that no one actually knows anything, right? That's not a super helpful message to just say, uh, throw up your hands, give up, everything is fake. But how do you actually figure out what is real in a world where pretty much everyone is kind of full of shit? So check this one out. Enjoy. Yesterday, before this podcast, I texted your boss, Steffi, who actually I think has maybe the second most downloaded interview on uh, on the show, I, I think. Um, I'm going for the title. Yeah. Well, yeah. You're, <laughs> hey, it's, it's, it's uh, the, the record. The world record is about to be broken. Um, but uh, but yeah, I texted her and I was like, hey, do you have any dirt on Ian um, that I should ask him about? And she said, no, Ian's unfortunately squeaky clean. <laughs> And I said, well, what I really want to know is why such a smart guy would decide to go into basically like a pre-scientific discipline like chiropractic that's just like you know, completely full of shit and it's like talking about a bunch of nonsense. And I'm like, yo, this might as well be the uh, – you know, the, the equivalent of, of the four humors in like medieval medicine. Like what are we doing here? So defend, defend, defend yourself. Okay, I'm, I usually defend myself by totally throwing chiropractors under the bus <laughs> because I agree with every word you said. I literally have gone into the clinic and be like, well, we're going to talk about black bile today, I guess. It's just as valid as a subluxation, I guess. <laughs> you know, I guess we're healing people with our hands today. You know, <laughs> I guess we're going to keep them as fragile as possible, as long as possible, and tell them everything that's wrong with them so they continue to, to feel disabled and incapable. Um, I... I, I have a really severe aversion, I call it an allergy, to the way I feel like most chiropractors, you know, practice what they would call medicine or what they would actually call like anti-medicine or something. Um, but it's like, I don't even, I don't even know how it ended up like that. It's so... In defending myself, I, I want to go into why I chose chiropractic school over a, a different type of healthcare profession, I guess. Because um, the license is still valid, right? The law respects a chiropractic license just as it does a, a PT license. You know, you, you can bill insurance. Um, it's, you know, it's pretty close to, you know, a medical doctor's license minus drug surgery and delivering babies and, and there's some small exceptions to those rules in certain states but the the clinical training you get um, is obviously different in some ways and similar in other ways but going into chiropractic school the main de you know decision factor was actually the proximity of the school and the fact that they didn't require any science credits in undergrad so that is kind of a red flag I guess sometimes uh, <laughs> Um, and they and they try really hard to catch people up who who don't have basic science credits who don't have pre med credits, um, but it's but some people are just kind of behind the horse the whole time. I mean, even if you had those credits, sometimes people just can't keep up at a graduate level, and that's just a, pro a competitiveness problem um, that only really some medical schools can get around by having just a really competitive admissions process. But so I went in, you know, thinking, okay, I'm gonna get this license. I'm gonna learn some things, you know, that I could, you know, hopefully take away and work with people who have some pain or have some injuries or, or need rehabilitation, and it'll complement my existing offering of training and exercise and nutrition advice, um, and kind of lifestyle and behavior advice. Uh, and I went in, and you get exposed to a lot of information. The basic science curriculum is basically the same as any other curriculum, and to my understanding, but then you get exposed to a lot of ideas. A lot of theorizing, a lot of bio plausibility, as, as you know, I've heard some people like to say, which I like the term, 
which yeah. just means like it sounds like it should be true based on my knowledge of anatomy and physiology but when i test it i have no idea and oftentimes it's not true at all um but that that comes but people believe it's true because that's how they source their knowledge is from their knowledge of basic sciences and or the knowledge that they've been inherited in their in their professional curriculum um but you but you see those ideas and you and you have your own experience and then you see that those ideas that you're presented with it are inherently conflicting and then you are exposed to basic research methods but not enough and it seems impenetrable so you're like man maybe you know scientific literature and the way we've actually agreed that we acquire knowledge over time is more valuable than simply reading what someone wrote in a book that seems like conjecture or hearing your teacher's interpretation as kind of different than what the thing was in the book um, right there seems like too much conflict maybe we can describe that conflict in terms of in terms of math that has uncertainty accounted for in it that we can quantify um, so you learn a little bit about research methods but not nearly enough to be competent in it so so that's kind of, that was kind of my direction I was like okay I need to go back to my AP statistics in high school and my <laughs> and my basic knowledge of of applied mathematics and probability theory to understand what this evidence is and what it's talking about and and kind of make sense of 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 the data and the recommendations and then when you do that you end up in a whole different place essentially and you realize that a lot of the you know a lot of the standard practice is 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 not recommended and you realize that people don't have a very good idea of what of of how to make sense of of research evidence and then they throw around terms like evidence based or 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 kind of uh, some something like that, like science, scientific or, or or recommended or or kind of effective, and they don't really know how to actually support their idea or even criticize their own idea. They have no language for actually questioning their own beliefs, and all they do is simply believe. They think that they're they that they acquire knowledge based on experience, but it just seems like. It, it's actually in reverse. They acquire a belief and then they experience the world based on that belief. And that just seems like a huge fundamental structural problem when people don't agree from first principles how you acquire knowledge and how you modify your beliefs over time. And that is a problem that, that exists across healthcare to some extent because it's a, it's a clinical training, not a scientific training, which means that you're really taught procedures and algorithms and you're not really taught to question those algorithms very effectively because that because we don't think in those terms very, very well, and it's it's hard to make decisions in probabilistic terms, not in certain terms. If that makes sense. Like when you're making a decision to treat or not treat, you don't think you don't have like a probability weighted decision tree in your head, and then you're thinking in terms of you know confidence intervals. Like oh, there's a 95 percent chance that this treatment is ineffective versus this treatment. Can I compare these treatments? Can I compare that to doing nothing? You know how what is the source of the benefit? Could I could I modify the benefit? You're taught okay for this do this. If I see this, that means this. Right, and there, and those things are taught based on test-taking strategies, based on memorization, based on managing all the possible clinical presentations that you can see. And that just that puts that kind of beats the 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 curiosity, kind of the the, the scientific spirit out of people. And again, that's kind of no exception in healthcare, but but chiropractors seem to be particularly not good at at breaking through that kind of bar that thought barrier that exists based on your clinical education and they become very closed and dogmatic about the things that they've inherited and in many ways it represents medicine pre-1920 when all schools were just selling snake oil um, <laughs> <laughs> and and there was no rigorous standard there was no standard education there was no credentialing there was no basis in in experimental science because the field of statistics was pretty new so there's no experimental testing of procedures but then eventually medical schools agreed that 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 evidence had to presuppose treatment decisions and that evidence had to be sourced from epidemiological population based data because that was the best way that they could account for for randomness and for human bias in their observation and we and in, there's obviously people in the chiropractic world who really believe that and are working towards that it's just i don't interact with enough people who really operate from that perspective and really honor those decisions and they really don't act like they believe it. They might say they believe it. So that's a kind yeah. of a long-winded answer because if they said they believed it, they would do different things. 
but they're like, oh, I know that's that's right. I know that's evidence based, or like, or they may just think it because me or someone like me said it. You know, they actually can't. They haven't been given the tools by their education to actually make that appraisal themselves. But they go do what they what they would normally do. What's not recommended because of economic incentives, because of their, it's comfortable for them, because it's what they know doing. They, they, it's what they know that they can do well or what they think they can do well, and. You, they just are able to hold that cognitive dissonance in their head. Yeah, totally. Right. At, at the at kind of the expense, I don't think they realize the, or or maybe my bias is to see that as, as something that's a disservice to patients and to healthcare as a system and also to them as, as a, as a healthcare profession. Yeah. Yeah, so I I want to I want to clarify that I was kind of joking when I was like totally roasting chiropractors, um, right? I mean, certainly uh, I think I think that that folks in the chiropractic community, a lot of them recognize that the the original doctrine of chiropractic of you know the cause the the cause of all problems is subluxations, yeah. and you know if you're if you have allergies, it's this vertebrae, and if you have uh, like a tingle in your yeah. uh, your knee, it's this vertebrae, and it's the liver is connected here. Like you know, a lot of people don't really buy that anymore. Um, um, and, and I think that the the actual, like you mentioned, the the license of chiropractic gives you a lot of um, whatever leeway to do different things. And um, a lot of folks use the license of chiropractic to practice what I would consider to be like very solid, um, you know, let's let's use one of your buzzwords, evidence based, essentially modified yeah. physical therapy. Yeah. Right? So so the uh, um, yeah, I, would I, call I was it, at least partially joking, but I would you know, call it like musculoskeletal medicine or pain care great. or something like that. Right. Love it. Yeah. Um, so so let, let's let's dive into some maybe specific examples. Right? I mean, we, we spent a while talking about just kind of like the uh, um, the discomfort of having uncertainty of thinking in statistical terms of recognizing that, you know, your experience could potentially lie to you of having an understanding that, you know, you may be doing all kinds of tests and assessments and things like that. But the, the potential reliability of those tests is not always great that the um, uh, sensitivity and specificity, meaning like, you know, likelihood of false positives or false negatives negatives is potentially all over the place. And it's just like this super messy, uncomfortable situation, but you have to actually do something. So mm -hmm. do you have maybe an example of, um, you know, the, the, the type of thing that you might be thinking about, uh, you know, through this messy, complex statistical lens and the way that someone who's thinking much more linearly would approach it? Uh, yeah. So the way I, the way I, you tend to think about those things when there's when there's a lot of, of small influences on a complex presentation is that you realize it's very hard to meet a statistical threshold where you, where you know exactly what's going on minus one glaringly obvious thing. Like if someone's femur is poking out of their leg, <laughs> they probably broke their leg, right? If they're saying, if, you know, if, you know, there's certain clinical presentations that are pretty obvious because because the probability that there's a, a specific underlying cause is so high. The problem is with, when most people have something like back pain, 90% of the time, there is no single underlying cause that's appreciable. So there's many small contributing factors. And then when you have many small contributing factors, each contribute to a relatively unpredictable but small degree, which means it's actually very hard to single out one variable and treat that one variable as if it were you know, effective at managing the entire presentation or helping that person. So you need a, a comprehensive approach, right? And then, then you think about interventions in, as, as general in terms of targeted, and that's a lot of, a lot of the evidence that we, that we find suggests that general interventions are, are just as effective as targeted interventions, but targeted interventions are, are more expensive or, 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 you know, or have unintended consequences like right, promoting this idea of false positives or, or over medicalizing the problem or right. They, right. There's all to, to every target, there are off target effects that we need to appreciate that aren't always captured in, in our clinical encounter or in our appreciation of it. So what that means is we, when we, make those decisions about intervention, we need to consider more things than what we think is causing the problem. And maybe that idea of causation actually isn't that helpful. It's like, maybe we actually need to consider what the presentation is. Is it serious? If it's not serious, 
do we understand the prognosis or the trajectory of it? And that also is, is de defined mostly by evidence, right? By do we know from cases like yours what the trajectory of that case is? And if it's good, then, then we need to weigh the, the, the benefits versus harms, right? So there's a lot more that goes into it than, than just a diagnostic accuracy framework because, because there's a huge range of uncertainty even if you're pretty certain. And even if you know, have a good intervention, it doesn't, you don't necessarily know that the cost of that intervention outweighs the benefit. Does that make sense? That's kind of a yeah. theoretical perspective on it because we don't realize that, the co that for many people, right, for many people with kind of just normal aches and pains, that stuff self-resolves so quickly that there's cost to intervening in any way. So not only can I not find out what, what's, going on, what's going on with you very well, because there isn't one thing that's going on. It's just, it's a, it's a complex emergent experience. But if I were to do something, it likely provides no benefit and there's possibly unintended harms. Right. So yeah. So, yeah, let, so let, 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 yeah, let's dive into that real quick. Cause mm. I think that the, the idea of there being a cost to treatment mm. is actually super, super important. So, mm. um, I mean, sort of, sort of the way that you're, you're framing it, it's like, okay, there's potentially, um, whatever unintended consequences since you're interfering with a complex system. Mm. And then there's also the opportunity cost of whatever you are doing is something yeah. else that you're not doing. Yeah. So how do you think about the actual potential costs yeah. also, of a treatment? Also economic costs and cost of time, right? And also the opportunity cost of, of pursuing a more effective strategy. Um, so though I generally think in those terms for the patient, because we because if we're in a, ideally we're in a system that optimizes for reduction in cost and, and the best possible outcomes, not the most extracted value for the clinician, right? Which can possibly be at the expense of patients, right? Because, because physicians could treat healthy people and just make a ton of money, but you just need to convince people that they're sick, right? Um, sure. Uh, but that's not the, the aim of healthcare. The aim of healthcare is to intervene for people who need help and to guide them back to uh, you know, recovery and the full resumption of activity. But what that means is we need to think in those terms of minimizing harm and we also need to understand why people get better. And we understand that people, get people do get better because of active treatment effects. People also get better a lot because of placebo effects or contextual effects, meaning there's a lot of deep stuff that goes into that in terms of expectations and changes in behavior because there, because there isn't any intervention. Right? There are essentially effects that are non-specific to your, to your individual intervention. They would happen with any kind of similar level of intervention. And that's powerful in any medical intervention. It's the more, more powerful, the more expensive, and the more experimental, and the more novel the procedure is. And there's a lot of other things that potentially modify it. And then there's just right, things like the natural history of the, of the disease. People just get better with time or the natural history of the condition. And that's powerful. And that obviously explains a lot of, of improvement. And it's hard to separate those three things. And even there's a statistical effect of regression to the mean, right? That just people. And the way that manifests itself in, in pain is people generally seek care when they are the most acute or when they're most flared up. And that's also when they're the most likely to get better. The most extreme values are also the most likely to improve. And that creates the illusion of improvement. Yeah. Can you, can you right? quickly give a, a breakdown of regression to the mean and how that works? Yeah. So regression to the mean. So you, you think, I mean, there's the classic kind of like, Francis called an example of, of understanding normal distributions, like distributions that are symmetrical and have, you know, consistent patterns. And it seems like, you know, when you sample large enough populations, they're all normal. Um, but it's like, uh, so he, you need to understand why tall people don't have taller children. Right, and and it's if you kept breeding taller people, why don't they have you know enormous children based on randomness <laughs> over time? And you need to understand that the most extreme values, because of a lot of random effects and because of time, in in the case of pain, it's kind of a little different, are most likely to regress to the mean. So you actually get so when you actually plot those numbers out, you actually get a slope less than one, meaning that there's kind of a not a complete correlation between the height of the parent and the height of the children. The children are average slightly slightly lower. 
in, in height than the parent. And the way that manifests in pain, if you take pain presentations over time with the same group, they'll 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 slope down. And and the most extreme people will 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 have the most aggressive reductions in pain. So it's not so your 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 starting point of pain influences your rate of pain regression. So right, so that's a covariable that's important to consider. So people with mild pain don't necessarily improve as fast as people with severe pain. Right? And that's just intuitive, but we but when you observe people, you don't capture that. Only when you look at them in, in terms of a population do you see that. Yeah, and and that that's really that's really interesting because I mean, sort of like you you hinted at the people who are most likely to actually come in and seek treatment are people who are currently experiencing some sort of severe painful episode, and then that population is the population that is most likely to have like a sudden reduction in their symptoms because their painful experience is potentially, you know, already an outlier relative to the entire population. So you get this like, you know, um, effect of like feeling like you're doing all this stuff for people, but potentially, you know, most of them are just having an outlier experience that is going to regress to their sort of like normal day-to-day non-painful life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So some, something else that you mentioned too, is just this idea of like, uh, let's call it threshold effects, right? Where you have, um, you know, some cases where it's like, all right, your leg is poking out and we can see that your femur is just snapped in half. Like, cool. You have a broken leg, right? Um, you, you know, that, that, that there are scenarios where there's a very obvious linear cause and effect type of scenario, but in a lot of situations that someone is dealing with as potentially a coach or as, um, what, what was the term you used for like movement based medicine? What was it? What? What uh, you said something about like musculoskeletal yeah, movement muscul- based. Yeah, musculoskeletal medicine or like pain care. Great. Musculoskeletal medicine, right? And a lot of those scenarios, you're dealing with people who have some sort of like chronic issue that kind of gradually showed up over time. You know, like, yeah, you know, my elbow started to feel a little weird and then I did a bunch of pull-ups and it felt a little bit worse and it kind of feels better. But when I like turn a doorknob a certain way, it hurts. Mm. And sometimes it hurts in the night and other times it doesn't really. And I don't really know what's going on, right? It's like a lot of stuff like that that's really difficult to kind of pin down. And so like you mentioned, a lot of these things don't necessarily have have a singular cause. You're probably dealing with with something that's essentially a threshold effect where you have a lot of different causes potentially, you know, all aggregating aggregating up into that specific symptom. Um, so how do you think about trying to unravel something like that? And then adjacent, how do you think about explaining something like that to a patient who is looking for a linear cause and effect scenario? Uh, so that's one of the most common things is people come to a visit with an expectation that there is a cause for their pain because for whatever reason that's what we that's what we're conditioned to believe i think we're 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 naturally inclined to believe that there's an easy to explain cause for everything i don't think it's necessarily specific to pain but the way we get around that uncertainty is not by lying to people uh i think it's by reaffirming their prognosis by saying we know it's not these things that are really concerning, that we're pretty sure it's not these things that are really concerning, or we don't, oh, we're, you know, you're not hundred percent certain of anything, but we are, and but we are pretty confident that this will improve, that that these things help it improve, and that this is kind of a manageable and achievable plan, right? And if you kind of redirect their attention towards their goal and not necessarily towards the source of their pain, which is what they actually think will help them achieve their goal, they just need to remove the source of their pain. Um, I think you can disconfirm that, that kind of broken logic. And also you can provide examples of how that's not necessarily the case, but that's, that's only for someone who's really interested in that. But, but yeah, I think it's more about showing people that, that, that linear cause and effect doesn't really make sense in terms of their, even their own experience that some things, right. That these structures aren't causing pain because there are ways that they can move that put a lot of stress on the structures, but don't cause pain. Or that if they move a little, if they move a little differently, or they behave a certain, or they behave differently, or they're under a little less stress, or whatever, all of a sudden their pain experience changes. So they know there's a lot of ways that they can still intervene. There's a lot of controllables there besides their anatomy, which is not necessarily that controllable. 
So you're able to sort of get an understanding of, of that concept of, you know, it's, it's not totally linear. It's not simple cause and effect, not necessarily by busting out a whiteboard and being like, okay, well, let me show you, you know, some, <laughs> some statistics and all this yeah. nonsense that we're talking no. about. You just sort of lean on giving them a very tangible experience. Yeah. And the experience is even done by trying to figure out what hurts. It's like a lot of stuff doesn't hurt. And you can remind people that a lot of stuff doesn't hurt, right? You can play back the wins. It's like, man, if that was broken, you'd be in really bad shape. It's, but you're in pretty good shape, all things considered, right? And you just reaffirm the, the, the positivity of their condition and the hope. And, and you show people that it, it's a little more complicated than the things they tend to focus on. Right, because because you could kind of forget about everything that's going well when something's going wrong, and that's kind of the point of the of the that kind of that pain as an emotion or as a sense making apparatus. It kind of right orients you towards threat, and you kind of forget about everything that's not a threat. But we need to remind people that they're actually not under that much threat. Yeah, yeah. So if we're thinking about this idea of again, like you mentioned, a lot of different effects with small effect sizes, right? Maybe very conditional in terms of, you know, how much stress are you under? What position are you in? Um, you know, what did you eat recently, et cetera, to actually get, again, this kind of like aggregation of a bunch of different things to actually give someone this threat response or this this pain experience. Mm -hmm. what, what are you thinking about in terms of trying to, to work through that? Are you trying to kind of go like piece by piece and start working on little pieces of it? Or are you working more from like a, a, a top down perspective of like, all right, can we just like get you to, to, to reduce the global threat response, which should potentially, potentially alter all those different, you know, more, more minor effect sizes. Um, I think it's more about general. I mean, this is kind of a general thing. Uh, there's just so little, kind of high quality evidence to, to suggest that highly targeted interventions for for kind of assuming there's kind of a chronic thing that's going on that's hard to resolve that anything more than than helping people reduce their disability which is much more of a kind of system level functional challenge than than changing the status of the tissue that is compromised if there is one make that makes sense yeah, because right? if it was a question of fixing their knee, then then meniscus surgery would have an effect that's that's independent of a placebo effect, which we don't actually see. Right. Yeah. Can you so, can you can you elaborate on that? Because I think that that's a really interesting point. Yeah. So people are like, oh, my knee hurts because I have a torn meniscus. And like that makes sense. It's bio plausible. The problem is we've done very, very well controlled. Uh, sham trials where a, a group of people who are almost exactly the same, again, it's not subgrouped very well, so there might be, some people might have an effect and some people might have no effect, but overall these groups have are, are equal and they're, they're large. Some group, some one group gets the full surgery, one group gets the sham surgery, meaning they, all they get is a, an incision in the operating room, they don't get any modification to their meniscus, they don't cut anything, they only just open them up and close them up, and they go through all the same rehab. And then they measure outcomes, you know, long-term follow-up, like six months, two years. And then, and, and everyone's blinded except for the surgeon who didn't or didn't do the, the, the orthoscopy. Um, and obviously the surgeon doesn't really see the patient anymore. So everyone thinks that everyone is, is totally blind, including the patient, to what group the patient is in, whether they have their torn meniscus or not. And, and some of them have even included the, the writers of the manuscript are also blind. And they only find out after writing two manuscripts. So they can't interpret the data in a way that magnifies the effect. Sure. And then when you do that, you see no effect. In earlier papers where there was more potential for bias, you see significant effects. But the, but the more well-controlled the paper is, the, the, the fewer effects, which indicates that almost all, if not all, of the observed effects previously were due to systematic bias in the papers um, or unaccounted for bias, essentially. And... But, but what that means is people who didn't get their meniscus fixed did just as well as people who did. So maybe the meniscus wasn't the problem, or at, at least for the vast majority of them, or, or if it is, it's only for a tiny fraction of the population, right? There's still additional questions there. But, but so then for me, when I do, you know, like a, a non-invasive intervention, like how do I justify the idea that I'm fixing anything and reducing inflammation or 
or mobilizing or reducing or breaking up adhesions. That's all, that all doesn't make any sense. If the most extreme thing I can go do is open you up, actually fix the thing, close you back up, and I have no evidence that actually, that actually provides any benefit beyond kind of the ritual of doing it. Right, all the other unintended effects like the, the forced time off and the rehab and the attention and the expectation of benefit. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. All, so that's a comprehensive intervention. How can we mimic the contextual effects without the active treatment? That doesn't seem to provide much of any of an effect. So you, met, you mentioned the idea of these, these um, studies like this potentially not being subgrouped very well, which is something I've wondered about with, uh, with some of the pain science stuff that I've looked at, right? Is that, okay, is, is there some sort of um, threshold past which, you know, specific tissue damage in the meniscus does sort of like invariably cause pain and is fixed by surgery? Do you know if anything like that has been looked at? Um. So there was a good NIH paper that suggested that there's no good evidence to suggest that any orthopedic surgery has any independent uh, active treatment effect, but there is some uh, evidence for other surgeries like G, you know GI or related pain, right? Pain from cancer. Like there's 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 like real medical cases of clearly you know surgically demanding pain. Uh, if that makes sense, right? But but we yeah. we live in the world of orthopedics, so we don't really deal with those things. But yeah, it's like right if you have a big tumor on your pancreas and it's causing you pain, you the, get surgery, you know, re, you know, get it removed because it also will pro, might, that will be the thing that saves your life. You know, the standard of care for 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 cancer is important, right? But if you're and also there might be an effect of. Uh, of total knee replacements and total hip replacements again that but that's not subgroup very well but the outcomes for those for those surgeries are really good but we just don't know if they're good independent of contextual effects sure uh, but the effect sizes are good right there's there's actually very low risk relative to other surgeries the recovery time is very short so those things all go into the decision of actually deciding to get surgery because it's not just right now right now we can't say oh never get surgery and also we can't really even say that you know, just continue to get more care as 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 you continue to experience your problem, and and as as kind of additional levels of non-invasive care fail until you reach the point where the next level is surgery. That's hard advice to give too. It's just a struggle to figure out where it fits in to the paradigm because it, because it might provide benefit to some people. It's just it's very hard in our current uh, kind of structure of 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 testing interventions rather than interventions on patients, right? We test interventions in populations and we measure central tendencies, right? We do, you know, null hypothesis significance testing, right? And we don't do kind of more precision data analysis, which is actually probably coming along more as we acquire more patient data because you need mountains of patient data to actually do kind of a different, uh, a different type of, of appraisal of treatments on a per patient basis because you need to find very similar patients and test them against each other in a kind of a case model. Yeah. Um, which is a, which is a machine learning problem essentially because it's an enormous amount of data that's required and it's a clustering problem and it's a, right. It's a, it's a, it's a kind of a, it's a big data challenge. Sure. Yeah. And I, I think that maybe a, a way to think about that cause you know, like you said, we talk about a lot of different studies, et cetera, which are essentially averaging across whatever the studied population is and hoping that the, um, you know, the, there's some sort of consistency in the types of populations that are selected and that the differences between those people will kind of like wash out and we'll be able to get some sort of signal to be able to do something, right? But, but an example that I think I've used in the past potentially is, you know, you could do a study on a group of people and say, you know, all right, we're going to, we're going to do this study. We're going to find out if people like going to nightclubs, right? And you send them all out, send them to a nightclub and do some sort of follow-up to see if they had a good time. Yes or no. And you're going to get some sort of 
answer to that. Like, do people like going to nightclubs? Yes or no. Mm-hmm. Right. But if you actually look at the individuals, like everyone has an intuition that people vary wildly across traits yeah. like extroversion or, you know, comfort in a place like a nightclub, et cetera. And so each individual is potentially going to have a wildly different response to going to a nightclub. It doesn't mean you can't study that question, mm. but it does mean that, like you said, that there's a lot of a yeah. lot of potential variation that isn't properly captured in some of those studies. Yeah, well, it is captured, but it's captured in terms of confidence intervals and standard deviations, and it's, right. and and it's impossible to know where an individual patient falls when the vari- when variables are accounted for as just randomness, right? C- right, because essentially you're assuming a certain level of randomness, and you're trying to minimize the number of, of variables you're accounting for. Meaning, right, if you're measuring the effect of a treatment on a certain population, all you're really the, the, there's a huge limit to the number of claims you can make based on that test. You can barely even you can barely even make the claim that you've uh, accepted an alternative hypothesis. All you can say is that, or it, you can, or you can barely even say that you've done anything other than lost confidence in your null hypothesis, meaning there is no difference. Right? You're more hesitant to 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 accept it. Right? So you're more likely to reject it in that population, which is a theoretical construct. Right, which doesn't mean you can apply it to a different population necessarily, but we do think about relative degrees of generalizability or the way we can apply it to another population. But so we're really thinking about theoretical notions of a population that's really imaginary, and we're we're assuming um, certain kind of qualities of that population, and then we're measuring, uh, you know, very basically we're measuring the parameters of that population and seeing the likelihood that 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 we're measuring something that's not due to chance that's all we're really doing and then we're trying to explain what that non-chance effect is and yeah. then over time we un- we better understand those non-chance effects to think of to be able to predict what will happen to an individual patient is is more complicated than that a lot of times it can be if you know, we we can get some help from from those effects that we observe in populations but sometimes it needs to be more targeted than that. And the way you would do that is, I mean, there's people working on it. It's either, you know, it's through, um, I mean, it's kind of a, I've, I've, there's a bunch of different things people have called it, but one of my, the way I think about it is, right, population-based medicine is evidence-based medicine. Um, precision evidence is, is medicine-based evidence. So you use medical histories or data on all these patients, and then you can find index patients relative to your case patients that are identical and measure their course and the effect of the treatments. So you can say that this treat, this patient in your library of millions of patients received is, is exactly like my patient genetically, you know, um, in terms, you know, pheno, phenotypically case history behaviors, even potential confounders. Um, and it's like, and then we can then we can begin to predict how they will respond to a given treatment because we know basically they have gotten the treatment but in in another as as if we pretend essentially the other person that received the treatment is that patient but that again that requires a lot of computing power yeah so that that might be something like um you know if people are familiar with with facebook ad targeting where we're able to create like a look alike audience Right, we're able to say, okay, this is a, a a group of people who I know respond well to this type of advertisement. Um, Facebook, go ahead and crunch your crunch your numbers on all the different data points you have on all these people, and some machine learning algorithm comes up with some sort of incomprehensible vector space of all the different things that that group of people is interested in, and you know what they've clicked on, and mm-hmm. what websites they visited, and you know it's 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 a it's a stew of, of matrices that like you said, requires an incredible amount of computing power, but you could potentially do something similar for treatments, right? And rather than just being like, okay, like these people all clicked on my stupid ad to buy a stupid product. Um, so let's find other people who, again, share traits in vector space with those people, but you might be able to do something similar with treatment outcomes. Is that, is that, a, is that correct? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, essentially. 
That's cool. Is is what what's the? Um, I know some companies are doing that in the cancer space. Mm-hmm. Um, there's yeah. one in Chicago called Tempest that's doing that. Do you know of any people who are doing that more in like the uh, physical therapy rehab no. chiropractic space? No, there's not enough money in it. Um, and also, it's 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 kind of novel territory for big tech firms that have machine learning capabilities. So I know, right? There's an Amazon Health business that's that's evolving. I know Google has has purchased tens of millions of patient records for the same reason, right? Because they see the value in patient health data and they have the, right, the cloud infrastructure to, to, to clean it and work on it. Uh, but and probably very few people do. And those other, those health players are probably going to either be partnering with, with large tech firms or gonna, they're going to be acquired by them. Why wouldn't there be enough money in it? Some for, ungodly number of people have back pain. Cause it's not, but the cost to the system isn't isn't as lucrative as cancer or or diabetes. So those are the first. And also the the the, pa- the patient data is so distributed and so bad uh, that it's that it's hard. And also the the pot, I think people are playing the you know the costs are lower, the the potential harm the risks are lower, and the potential upside is lower. Right? There's there's not as much of an incentive to make it better. Right, there's not sure. as much Although, of a, I mean, the cost can't possibly be low. I mean, I, I imagine if you yeah, just the, the, total the, like, the yeah. lost work hours and workers' comp associated with back pain, that that has to be some Yeah, but, but there's no single player that's incurred, incurring those costs, right? The, the insurance payer is incurring the cost of treating a cancer patient. Sure. Right. Um, and... Yeah, and the therapies are expensive, and and they're trying, and there's just there's a lot more money changing hands. Yeah, when you account for the number of people, the total costs are high, but there are a lot of indirect costs. You know, it's it's you know NSAID purchases and it's missed work days and it's loss in productivity, which is which which we measure as those are externalities that are that no one is capturing. It's the same reason why, you know, people still you know dump chemicals into the river, even though it's sure. bad for society. Right, it's just not as bad for them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so there's there's not you know that that specific firms may actually bear the cost of this, and the entire system bears the cost of it. But there's not necessarily a large enough player who is experiencing the pain of the cost of people, yeah, and whatever, I'll, being uncomfortable and not as productive or missing work days. Yeah, and I think there is an opportunity for disruption, right? I think all of healthcare is disrupting, but it's like you 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 as a as a tech firm. You want to disrupt kind of the big player, right? And the big kind of cost structure, which is the hospital infrastructure. You know, for me, yeah, there's totally a, an opportunity to disrupt the way we we care for people in pain. Um, but it's you know it's it's just a question of who's going to do it, essentially. Yeah. Well, what kind of data would you need? I mean, uh, uh, the the patient outcome data, like you said, is probably super messy because I don't even know what the um, health records or reporting requirements are, especially across different disciplines like chiropractic and physical therapy and mm-hmm. athletic trainers and a bunch of different groups who are potentially dealing with these types of musculoskeletal problems. Mm-hmm. Like, what what would that data actually look like yeah, if you were to try to to it, figure it out? Well, I think the the main problem is the quality of the data. Is I mean, in Florida, seventy percent of chiropractors who filed the Medicare were, or, you know, were essentially fraudulent claims because of insufficient documentation. We have no standard. We have requirements that vary state by state. Medicare has its own requirements. They're old, and and we barely can audit them. Right, and a lot of people just don't document. Right. Uh, so that's a huge problem. And we, so that's a, that's, you know, you just can't feed a machine learning system garbage data. It's going to give you nonsense, right? Garbage in, garbage yeah. out, right? More, more bad data on top of bad data equals noise. Uh, so that's the number one problem. I mean, we run into that with, with, with training data. It's like, it should be easy to create, you know, deep learning systems that understand training better than, better than our human conceptual models, but nobody has a good library of good training data. Right. Yeah, like what are you going to do? What are you what are, what are you going to put in there in terms of like? Yeah. Oh, they did this many back squats and they did this many thrusts. Yeah, exactly. And, like, and their progression over what... years and the, it, all like as much information as you can put about the person and about you know their evolution over time. Um, nobody's collecting that, investing, collecting that data. 
hospitals have been much more rigorous in collecting that data, and there's a ton of medical errors in that system, and, and that's one of the big challenges that, that tech companies are working on is how to clean the data. Yeah. Um, because, you know, when, when there's decimal places in the wrong place, when there's names that are missing, you know, that really messes up the data. And, it, right. and machines don't know any, any different. They'll, they'll just operate as if it were correct. I mean, you can, you can implement kind of Bayesian network systems that will probabilistically assume, based on information theory, like whether the, the thing they're seeing is an outlier, whether it's likely to be an error, and what the most likely error is, and then change the error, which I think is what people are working on. But again, you're going to do it where there's a high potential initial return. Uh, and where you need some sense of what an error looks like and what a, a typical value looks like. So, yeah, can, can you elaborate on that? So they're using essentially um, Bayesian systems to actually clean the data? Yeah. Like how does that work? So, right, there... And maybe, maybe you should quickly define Bayesian for, for folks who don't have a background in any of that yeah. statistical so, stuff. Yeah, so Bayesian is kind of an alternative model of statistical inference where you, you, you assume that you acquire new information about the world that that updates your belief about what caused that information, right? What it updates your prior belief. So it, it says that as we move through the world, we we learn more about what causes what, and it essentially allows us to flip, kind of. So we see this evidence, and it's given a cause. So we can then begin to ascertain the likelihood that there was a cause given the evidence. So you're in you're flipping the probability. I like to think of it as it's hard to 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 say, right, the Pope, given that the person is a Catholic, the likelihood that they're the Pope is not the same as given that the person that is a Pope, the likelihood that they're Catholic, <laughs> right? makes sense. Like the Pope is 100% a Catholic, but it's almost a 0% chance that a Catholic is the Pope. So you can't invert probabilities like that. You need a way of, of modifying your previous probability to account for a new condition, uh, if that makes sense. Right, so it's hard to think about this spatially, but then the way I think about it is, so you have this prior notion of a certain like of event happening. Say, uh, say you're walking through the woods and you hear kind of a you know, uh, kind of ruffling in the in the bushes. This is kind of from the, an article titled "The Bayesian Brain," because it kind of makes sense that we actually that we're actually wired this way. That neurons are wired to essentially as as with uh, kind of Bayes factors or probabilistic models of, 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 of kind of wiring. Um, it's, think, it's helpful to think of nerves in terms of computational units that kind of move up and down in their excitability, which they do, but it's not attached to a number, it's attached to a kind of a chemical status. So, but you're, you're wired a certain way about, based on your beliefs about the world. You hear a ruffle in the, in, the, in the bushes, you know from your previous experience that snakes ruffle the bushes. So given limited information you, and new evidence, you, you now have updated your beliefs about the bush to think that there's a snake in the bush. Uh, so you, you act accordingly. You, you, you jump back, you run the other direction, you get out of danger. Um, maybe, so now you're more sensitive to the idea because you have a new posterior likelihood. So you went through this, this prior likelihood. You, it's been modified by this base factor or this new, this new evidence and the likelihood that that evidence indicates a new condition, right? The kind of the, the, the likelihood ratio that this is caused by a snake and not a false positive. Like this, the same evidence could be caused by something else, like a stick in the wind or something. And you saw a snake and you run. Like next time, maybe you, you see this, this ruffling and it is just a stick in, in the bush or something. And now you reduce the likelihood that anytime you hear ruffling, you think it's a snake. So you're constantly changing your probabilistic assumptions about the world based on new evidence. So that's different than this kind of frequentist model where you, where you think there's kind of a fixed probability and, and, and central tendency or mean kind of state of, this, of the world. And the more information you get, the more you approach, the, 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 the better your accuracy at kind of figuring out what that central tendency is. Right, so the data in that system is highly variable, but the mean and probability is fixed. In a Bayesian approach, it's really just kind of a, a theoretical flip that the, the data is now, is now fixed and your probability changes over time and gets, gets uh, either 
it has room to get more accurate or change with changing conditions in the world. Sure. So there's a temporality element to it. And, and, it, and a lot of information systems use it because of that con continuous updating, right? Because it doesn't assume a fixed probability of anything. It updates with time and with enough data. And a lot of, you know, um, kind of evolving systems in, in business and prediction use it because we don't make any assumptions that there's a fixed probability estimate of the world because we know that things are constantly changing. So all, all it does is, a, is it, it, it's a model that accounts for past information to establish a prior probability. It, it asks what the probability is you know, now given new evidence and kind of what, the, what the, the power of that evidence is to modify our prior probability and establish a new, a new prior, which is our posterior. All right, so if you want to look up, I, I recommend reading more about it if you're kind of interested in, what, in how to make sense of that. It's not super complicated. The math gets kind of complicated and even kind of outside of my expertise because there's a lot of Bayesian probability theorists and statisticians out there who are much more into the theory. I'm, I'm obviously into the application of, of statistical modeling, statistical inference, because I think it says a lot about not only kind of what I talk about conceptually in my kind of domain expertise, but also the way business is conducted now on, on the internet with given the amount of information and data we capture about user behavior and experience and, and, and essentially what we care about in terms of how businesses operate, you know, profitability metrics and, and workflow and um, everything that matters, all our KPIs are, are essentially driven by modeling. And we make decisions based on data not necessarily based on the highest paid person's opinion. Yeah. Totally. And, and to give a potentially uh, uh, a topical example, right? I mean, we're recording this as a, a lot of the a lot of the the cities in the U.S. are, you know, shutting down due to the coronavirus. I think that that gives a, a lot of people a, a pretty tangible example of like a Bayesian process, right, where they potentially previously have, you know, experienced something like a, um, a media scare about SARS or swine flu or something like that, and then not, or Ebola, and nothing really happened. So they potentially have a prior probability of like, okay, there's this scary virus in the media, and the outside view of it is that, well, there's, you know, a pretty low percentage chance that this is going to actually turn into something that's um, going to actually impact my life because this happens every few years. The media freaks out. A few weirdos start buying shit online and like nothing changes for me. But then, you know, at some point uh, you're, you get a pretty hard update. For me, it was certainly the situation in Italy, right? Where you're like, okay, Italy is having a really, really bad time. And now my, my update of what the, the percentage likelihood that I think something is going to happen in Chicago changes pretty drastically based upon that. Because, you know, what, what, what do I think is actually different about Italy compared to Chicago compared to how far the virus has already spread? And that, that's a pretty tangible example of like updating based upon new information. Yeah. And, I, and literally that's how models of disease transmission for this virus specifically update. I read a paper from a couple of days ago that updated the uh, the estimation of the number of transmissions by asymptomatic carriers by by estim by tracking a prior estimate of a transmissibility yeah, I read the same thing. right right showing the showing the progression models showing the lack of concordance and then establishing a new a new posterior likelihood based on the you know the difference between observed data and predicted data right so they use bayesian inference to establish a new predictive value of the transmissibility from the percentage of the percentage of transmissions from asymptomatic carriers, so it's applied everywhere, and, and, and it's applied in information theory, and it's applied in our in our right now essentially our our up our constantly updating ways we weight incoming evidence. We do it intuitively, and we do we always do it kind of as a way to reconcile our beliefs and our and our observations. Right. Right. But um, but it's not always quantifiable. When we use it, you know, in term in, in in modeling, we we make it quantifiable, and that's really helpful because it, it it extracts our own. It, it 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 once we once we put our beliefs into the system, now the system is operating independently of our of our previous beliefs, as opposed to our beliefs override it continually being overweighted against new evidence, which tends to happen. Which is which is a way I t I like to think of kind of cognitive biases and how they interfere with our our kind of 
acquisition of knowledge about our experience. Yeah, totally. And so to sort of circle back to the point you were originally making, there's machine learning algorithms that will have some sort of, um, we'll call it a prior, right? An assumption of what a specific data point is going to look like. And it's going through the data and it's looking at it. And if something is way outside of its expectation, that that can trigger something that says, okay, this is probably an error based upon what my prior is for what this should be, and then can potentially just automatically clean the data um, by making that type of inference. Is that is that the yeah. the point of what you're? I mean, at? that like almost all information transmission works as a Bayesian network. It actually, sends multiple copies and it reconciles differences in the copies because there's error in transmission of of any digital information. That's that's always possible. So rather than breaking the transmission, it sends multiple copies, understands the yeah. likelihood of which one is the error. And which one is the good copy, and then changes the the error to the to be identical to the good copy. Yeah, and you see you see that in um, in networks yeah. like network protocols. Yeah. you see that actually in like DNA. Yeah. it's a pretty a pretty cool thing that yeah. like permeates our weird world. Yeah, it's a mechanism <laughs> of error correction and information transfer because anytime you move information from one place to another, there's a likelihood that you lose information in the transmission. Yeah, that's an yeah. old school information theory like Claude Shannon thing. But um, th that's again, there's other people that are experts on that who have studied that forever. And also, a good book is Judea Pearl's uh, the right the book of why. He talks a lot about information theory and Bayesian networks. I, I feel like you've I feel like you've told me about that before. Yeah. I don't think I I, I I wrote it down somewhere, oh, but that yeah. seems like something I should. Yeah, read. so that's a good reference for that. And there's a lot of causal diagrams and um, right because. Uh, because a neural network is essentially a very complicated causal diagram that draws an association um, that hopefully captures causation uh, from observational data. I mean, if you like, right, which is what we're talking about. We're running, you know, information through complex, uh, constantly updating things that essentially resemble very simple brains, right? Using silicon as, as the computational units rather than neurons. Yeah, for um, sure. So yeah, but but you know the machine is 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 obviously it only accounts for what you put into it, as opposed to humans that come with their own rich history and beliefs and kind of impenetrable qualities, <laughs> uh, which is which is which is the challenge of working with people. But that's why you have to deal with people as people as as a person in pain and not as a thing that that has pathology. So something else I wanted to touch on, and I'm actually stoked that we kind of, you know, went down the rabbit hole and started talking about Bayesian inference and um, different statistical models, right, is, is to kind of then circle back to this idea of people being in pain and it being this sort of like nebulous, difficult to parse thing that doesn't always have linear cause and effect and, you know, has really strange uh, effects of different treatments. And it just like kind of seems weird and difficult. Uh, and I think we talked previously about the idea of there being, you know, just sort of like a like a, a way of thinking about how the brain processes information based upon some understanding of Bayesian ideas that can potentially explain a lot of the weirdness that we see in pain science. Do you mm -hmm. have any thoughts on that or like a way to kind of tie that together? Um, I mean, there was a good article, I think it was 2018, called, you know, the Bayesian brain. It was about, it tried to explain the placebo effect in Bayesian terms, uh, that that the ritual of treatment is, provides the kind of, the, the change in the predictive value or weights kind of the, 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 the prediction of the brain that pain will resolve so much that it actually manifests the, the resolution of pain, regardless of the treatment. And if you think about it in terms of the all of the things that the that we see influence our prediction about what the world will be based on previous experience, that's a Bayesian model of of how we perceive the world. Right? If that so if we it's it's helpful to think that we right, this is getting into predictive processing, which is kind of a reduction of 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 kind of what we th what we think that we do when we when we when we essentially think about perception and cognition and and kind of the way we we kind of move through our experience but essentially our 
if we have prior beliefs and we see new evidence, we need to essentially fill in the gaps about the world based on both those prior beliefs and that new evidence. And we're taking evidence from, from, from all these different cues in the environment. And then we're, we're, we're kind of wrapping them together in a, in a picture of the world that may or may not be right, that may or may not be congruent. And we, and we, we kind of magnify those incongruencies and we chase the congruency, right? It's kind of jarring to be incongruent. Right, and that's and that's what pulls our attention, right? If something hurts worse than if if we if we're surprised by pain, it hurts worse than if we expect it, right? That kind of thing, right? So that says something about the nature of pain that it's that it's that if it's unexpected, it's alarming, it's more severe. If you know, if we if we expect relief, we get more relief. You know, when we expect an intervention, when we're when we're told to visualize the intervention, when we're told that the intervention will do be will do better, we see a better effect of the intervention. So we can modify our results based on modifying our expectations, which is modifying our priors. Right. So so we don't actually know, kind of, all the things that go into this kind of update constantly updating belief structure, but we we seem to to follow these rules that we're, that we're chasing a model of the world that we want to fulfill. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. Yeah. I think, I think maybe a good way to summarize it is that you have, like you said, an expectation and then you also have, um, reality and then you're, you're sort of constantly taking in the sensory information from reality mm. and comparing it to your expectation. Yeah. And the way that your brain processes information, it's not only updating its actual beliefs, it's trying to, to predict better, but it's also willing to discard stuff that doesn't fit its prediction. Mm -hmm. So it's this kind of like weird uh, dynamic of the, the actual processing of information attempting to converge on the actual um, whatever sensory input that it's experiencing. Yeah, I th right, because I think we 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 rely on our previous experience to perceive the world because it's so hard to constantly perceive everything in the world around you that's that's right, that's, a, that's a lot of information we selectively pay attention and we selectively filter so it's much easier to to think about to assume that the world is as it was and to only update the world we have in our head with really powerful evidence so we're inclined to believe right the thing we're inclined to believe our priors and not necessarily inclined to modify those. It's kind of expensive to go in and update those if we want to think about it that way. And so, so if you, so say you don't, say you have some sort of, it can works the other way. Say you, you don't really have much pain, but there's a good reason to believe that you should be in pain. You might begin to experience more pain, right? And that's kind of the underlying premise of a lot of pain sensitivity, kind of pain pressure threshold testing that's trying to design to, to lower your threshold or increase your pain sensitivity. Yeah. Right. And I think that maybe, maybe a way that I, that I think about some of this stuff as well is like, you know, you, you use the analogy of walking through the, walking through the woods and hearing a, hearing a bush, mm. you know, making some noise and there's a snake in there. And then if you have that as your one experience, then your prior for bush makes noise mm. or there snakes mm -hmm. is going to be extremely high. Yeah. Um, but if you think about from a pain perspective, it's like, you know, you can think about, okay, if I do this, my back hurts. Mm -hmm. And then you know, you can potentially have a very high prior for that. And a lot of different therapies can all potentially work in the sense that you're basically just showing someone a lot of bushes making noise with no snakes in them. Yeah. It's like, here's another bush that's making noise, but this is a, it's a, it's a vole. Yeah. Like here's another bush making noise. It's the wind. Here's another bush making noise. Actually, that's someone like far away and it's not even from the bush. Yeah. So you just are like giving a lot of different input that, that can potentially force an updating of that prior so that every um, yeah. experience isn't processed as painful. Yeah. And that's, and that, I mean, we, I've had uh, Greg Lehman on our podcast and, and he's talked about that specifically. There's like, we don't know whether the effect of our interventions is because of some correction of, of dysfunction or if it's because right we show people movement options that are that have lower pain and and therefore encourage them to move with less pain or reduce 
kind of their sensitivity to pain. And then we also might even push them in positions that are, are have some inherent discomfort and then show them that they can overcome it right through a great exposure kind of approach, right? That they go through the pain, it doesn't last very long and they see that they're fine on the other side. And this is, or they actually get stronger and then the, the load they experience or the challenge they experience actually gets lower and their, and their threat level goes down. And right. And if we're talking, if we're modeling this from a Bayesian perspective, their predictive value of pain continues to decline because we can modify that predictive value. And by modifying the predictive value, right, we're doing that through, through, through disconfirming evidence, which changes the posterior, which changes the new, the new priors. Yeah. Right. And it changes the, and then, and that prior is, is kind of attached to any new experience, right. Which is our kind of, our, our, our base factor essentially. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and and I think that's a really, that's a really good way of putting it. Is that like treatments could potentially be focused on either disconfirming evidence, Mm. um, or they could be focused on actually changing the stimulus to the system, Mm. um, in the first place, right? Yeah. So it's like a, what a lot of people say they're doing is changing the stimulus. Like, oh, we're going to fix this broken thing that is creating this pain stimulus for you. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it, like, like you said, it seems that the evidence that that's happening in a lot of cases is actually very low. Yeah. Um, but what they may be actually doing is providing a lot of disconfirming evidence to the Bayesian prior that like everything hurts and I'm broken. Yeah. And, you know, it works, but not for the reason that they say it does. Yeah. Like, yeah, man, like we're going to fix this adhesion we're going to adjust your joint. We're going to do this, that, whatever. Yeah. And like, really you're just feeding a lot of sensory information. And in that's like, Hey, you're okay. Like your joint can go over here. It can go over here. It can go like this. It can do this. And like, yeah. you're actually going to be fine. Yeah, exactly. Like you, right, with spinal manipulation, Hey, you can tolerate me. Like just laying on your back. Like I just literally karate chopped you in the back and you're fine. You know? <laughs> and then also like uh, Greg Lehman gave me the examples like, man, the, my, my physical therapist told me my, my glutes had amnesia. Or my glutes weren't firing, or that you know I had you know tight uh, tight psoas, and he gave me all these exercises, and then and then Greg's like, yeah, he just gave you a great resistance training program that you did consistently over a long period of time. Like I would give you the same thing. I just want to tell you that your your glutes start forgetting things, you know. Right. Um, well, and even if, even if you do take a, take a look at that stuff too, you can think about that from like a um, like a like a Bayesian perspective of movement, right? That you're you're neurological system will attempt to predict what you're trying to do and will reach for a specific movement pattern based upon that. So you can potentially actually change the prior of like how your movement, your subconscious movement system is going to attempt to create a movement strategy. Mm -hmm. And it's not the same thing as like, Oh, your glutes don't fire. It's like, we're going to update your, your whatever subconscious strategy that you're going to try to use. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think even, I mean, my bias is, is to remove the negative language, but you probably could keep some negative language and not harm as many people. I was like, hey, we can, we can apply a different strategy that's not better or worse. It might be more helpful, it might be more efficient for performance, but right, this strategy is not painful right now, right? And it might help you, give you some momentum in your, in kind of your, through your experience and in your recovery and allow this kind of pain sensitivity to reduce, right? To, to change that, that base factor for you. I wouldn't say base factor for people, but since yeah. we're in that, this is we're in that language, right? And then that just and that just encourages them that 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 the activity is safe, that that they're not compromised, that they can do things, and that they can modify their condition, and that's really about strength and resilience, and not about you know, you know, dysfunction and limitation, right? Because already, and you you, you got to get to another podcast, yeah. So <laughs> what we can we, we didn't even talk about any of the stuff with hybrid, uh, which I also had on my questions list, but that's fine. I mean, you you mentioned uh, the the podcast you do with hybrid, yeah. Um, you know, you've written a bunch of blog posts. What do you want people to check out if they like this this uh, very dense discussion <laughs> that we had that hopefully actually made some sense? I hope it makes a little bit of sense. I think we're I mean, all we're just trying to say is that. Uh, there's ways to account for, for uncertainty using, using kind of, uh, applied math and and probability theory and statistics that are kind of commonly accepted that we should know and we should, we should have a a working assumption kind of like, you know, you don't need to know how the car works, but you should know know how to drive it. You kind of know basically what these tools are and what they mean. And especially if you're making decisions about evidence and you're making decisions, I think if you're making decisions about business, if you're, you know, if you don't want to just trust expert opinion or you want to know how experts are sorting, sourcing their opinions, 
I think that's all important. And I think I've provided some direction even in here to help people with that. But for, for me specifically, um, you can follow me at my account, kaplanfitness.hybrid. That might change soon because I, because I get this doctor degree. I might change my handle a little oh, yeah. bit. Um, yeah. But you can follow me. You can follow Hybrid's Instagram. You can follow the Hybrid Unlimited podcast. You can follow Steffi Cohen um, on Instagram because we collaborate on a lot of her educational content um, on her YouTube. Um, yeah, I think that's, uh, that's a lot of different places you can find stuff I'm working on. It's a lot of, it's a lot of good places to, to follow. Mm. And I, and I will say that it's, you know, it's, it's the answers of, uh, that a lot of people put out there are like wrong and annoying mm. to people who actually know what's going on. And this idea of like, Hey, we're going to present with a bunch of statistical uncertainty and tell you no one knows anything and nothing works for the reason that you think it does mm. is not necessarily a popular message. Yeah. Uh, but I'm really stoked <laughs> that, you know, someone like Steffi, who's like, well, guess what? I can deadlift more yeah. than anybody ever yeah. actually gets an opportunity to sort of force feed people that. Yeah. Well, I think, yeah. In the, in the climate where people are selling their thing that matters the most, when you actually can communicate the uncertainty and say, well, there's some things that matter a good amount, but a lot of things don't matter that, as much. And you can basically choose based on what works for you. That's an empowering message, right? And you can focus on the big rocks and then help people design their, their, their habits and behaviors around what works for them specifically, knowing that they have a lot of freedom. I think that's just our message. Right? And I think it, I think it resonates with a certain, you know, percentage of people who aren't just looking for the one thing to latch on to. And also people can graduate from that one thing that they latch on to, to, uh, to holding a few more kind of ideas in their head and holding a little bit of uncertainty in their head and, and, and forgoing the idea that they know everything that they can continue to learn. Um, that those are the types of people we want to engage with in a track. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, the best thing to do would be to send it to one of your friends who also likes podcasts. If you want more, I have an email list where I send out a weekly update with all the podcasts I've recorded and articles that I've written. I also include my favorite things that I've been reading or listening to as well. You can sign up for that at www.toddneve.com. That's I before E. Or you can open up the show notes in your podcast player and click the link in there.